every weekend. Now more from today's hearing on crime prevention in U.S. cities. Today, the House Government Reform Committee held a meeting on the issue, and during this panel, heard from Philadelphia's police commissioner and a Florida state attorney. This hour and 10-minute portion begins with remarks by committee chairman Dan Burton. She did? Okay. The committee will reconvene, and I apologize for holding you gentlemen for so long, number one. And number two, I apologize to you for not having all of our members here. Uh, our members are running all over the place uh, to different committee hearings, and, and uh, uh, I guess I ought to have my hearings on a, on a Monday, line. Tuesday, or Friday, because it seems like on there. Wednesdays and Thursdays uh, everybody's holding hearings. Yeah, we got it. But uh, I really appreciate your being here, and I appreciate the, the records that you fellows have. Uh, State Attorney Shorstein, uh, why don't we start with you and uh, we'll have your hearing, your testimony and then we'll ask some questions after we hear from both of you. All right. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Committee on Government Reform, my name is Harry Shorstein and I'm the State Attorney for the Fourth Judicial Circuit of Florida. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today about our nation's criminal justice system. The title of your hearings, National Problems, Local Solutions, it's a perfect description of what I am here to talk about today. State and local government are better prepared and equipped to deal with problems of public safety than the federal government. It may be politically popular to tell the American people you are tough on crime, but do they know that while passing scores of new death penalty laws, you seldom seek it? Congress is considering federalizing juvenile crime, but if you do, I will prosecute in a day more cases than you will prosecute in all the federal courts, including the Indian reservations, in a year. The recent dramatic increase in the number and variety of crimes prosecuted by the federal government significantly overlaps and duplicates what has traditionally been within the purview of state courts. Between 1982 and 1993, Federal justice system expenditures increased at twice the rate of comparable state and local expenditures. Though politically popular, reduction of crime, particularly violent crime, has been adversely affected by federalization. Even with the trend to federalization, federal prosecutions comprise less than 5% of all criminal prosecutions. However, there is a legitimate and important role for the federal government in crime prevention. That role is through financial support of state and local law enforcement. That should not be curtailed. A perfect example of the appropriate and important role the federal government, that the federal government can play is the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. This agency provides critically needed support for creative, locally developed solutions to the problem of juvenile crime. When a local community comes together and makes a commitment to implementing a comprehensive approach to deal with crime, remarkable things can be accomplished. I would like to take just a few minutes of the committee's time to tell you about Jacksonville's approach to curbing juvenile crime. Since 1993, there has been a 44% reduction in arrests of juveniles for violent crime in Jacksonville. This includes a 78% reduction in murder, 51% reduction in rape and other sex offenses, 45% reduction in robbery, and a 40% reduction in aggravated assault. In addition to these violent crimes, there has been a 67% reduction in arrests of juveniles for the gateway crime of vehicle theft and a 56% reduction in weapons crimes. The picture in my community was not always so positive. When I took office, our city had faced a 27% increase in the number of juveniles arrested from 1990 to 1991. And during the four years prior to the implementation of our program, 1989 to 1993, juvenile violent crime arrests had increased 78%. Ours is a two-pronged approach to the problem of juvenile crime, one that incarcerates repeat and violent juvenile offenders 
and at the same time intervenes at an early age with children at risk of becoming criminals. In an article written for the New York Times, Fox Butterfield called our program of sanctions and intervention a preemptive strike approach to reducing juvenile crime and, of course, ultimately reducing all crime. The term preemptive strike describes vividly what we are trying to accomplish by moving decisively to head off problems before they occur or worsen. Our goal is to incapacitate serious habitual juvenile offenders during their most violent and prolific criminal period and do everything possible to return them after incarceration to an environment different from which they came. The combination of early intervention for at-risk youth and swift, hard punishment for juvenile criminals when appropriate <clears throat> is working in our community. We have shown that if we let common sense and not rhetoric guide the system, we can greatly reduce juvenile crime. Simply warehousing juveniles in jail is not a long-term answer. Working with other agencies, we have developed the Jail Juvenile Program. Juveniles in the jail attend school in regular classes held in the jail facility. They also receive drug counseling and participate in living skills, family planning classes, and anger control training. In an effort to provide these young offenders with positive role models, they are paired with mentors recruited by my office. The mentors visit them on a regular basis in the jail and continue to provide guidance for the juveniles after they are released from jail. Many of our prevention early intervention efforts are school-based. A career educator in my office coordinates programs with our schools. Truancy and avoiding out-of-school suspension are critical to juvenile crime prevention. When appropriate, we aggressively prosecute parents for not sending their children to school. To address the increasing juvenile drug abuse problem, I implemented a juvenile drug court. Juveniles accepted in the drug court are immediately enrolled in a multi-phased outpatient program. Juvenile Drug Court includes an educational component and psychological services for the juvenile and the parents. In summary, the answer is not punishment <coughs> or prevention. It requires both. I incarcerate more juveniles as adults than any prosecutor in the country. Equally important, I have more prevention, early intervention programs within my office. The answer is punishment and prevention, early intervention working together. A nonpartisan, balanced approach can have an unbelievable impact on crime and the welfare of our children. I thank the committee for their interest in the issue of criminal justice and more specifically, juvenile crime in the children of America. There is no simple solution to this very complex and difficult problem. Perhaps today's hearing should be entitled National Problems, Localities Seeking Solutions because every day we are trying new ideas and approaches. Some work and others fail. Some children turn their lives around while others fall into a life of crime. The one certainty is that unless the nation remains vigilant and focused on the problem of juvenile crime, the gains we have made will fade as we enter the new century. I feel confident, however, through aggressive prosecution combined with intensive intervention and prevention, the progress we have made will continue into the next century <coughs> and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shorstein. Uh, before we go to your video, uh, uh, and I understand you have a video you'd like for us to see. Yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Fatah uh, represents, I guess, part of Mr. Timoney's area, and he wanted to uh, make a remark or two about uh, the new commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to welcome uh, the, the commissioner uh, to Washington. And um, unfortunately, uh, here in the Congress, we don't coordinate scheduling. Uh, so even though I'm a member of this committee, I also have two other committees that are meeting at this identical time. Uh, but I did want to welcome you and your comments uh, and your testimony today here uh, obviously will be helpful uh, as the Congress goes forward. Um, and in addition to which, uh, the effort by the Congress and this administration to provide um, additional police officers, which uh, our city has benefited from, um, has been quite, uh, I think, a significant part of uh, both the New York story and the Philadelphia story, but nationwide. Uh, and earlier today, the President has offered the notion that 
we he was going to push for an additional 50,000 police officers on the street. Um, and I know that there's something very bipartisan about this issue of fighting crime, um, in which uh, both as Democrats and Republicans, I think we have the same um, the same desires. So um, it's I want to welcome you here, uh, and uh, and as much as uh, your work in, in Philadelphia has, uh, I think, brought um, appropriate attention and uh, the wisdom of the chairman and his staff to invite you, uh, wanted to stop by and say hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. Okay, I think we'll see the uh, video of Mr. Shorstein's right now, and uh, then we'll proceed with Mr. Timoney. Jacksonville is a city on the northeast coast of Florida. Population, nearly one million. It's known for the beautiful St. John's River. The National Football League's Jaguars. And for its dramatic results in turning around juvenile crime. State Attorney Harry Shorstein vowed to crack down on young criminals, and he came up with a unique and comprehensive plan. The hallmark of the program is that there must be punishment and prevention and intervention and they must be used in conjunction with each other. The keys are early intervention, truancy prevention, incarceration of habitual violent juvenile offenders as adults, and rehabilitation and aftercare for incarcerated juveniles. Jacksonville has been nationally and internationally recognized for its efforts, from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times, where Pulitzer Prize winner Fox Butterfield writes, the premise is the preemptive strike reaching young people before they commit multiple crimes. USA Today explains Jacksonville's tough policy pays dividends. Parade Magazine says it's a program that has proved successful. Good evening and Happy New Year. I'm Jim Lara. On the news hour tonight, fighting violent juvenile crime. Betty Ann Bowser reports from Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville's innovative approach has captured the attention of almost every major news media outlet in America. They should look at what's going on in Jacksonville, Florida. What I saw was a stark <clears throat> change in the type of juvenile crime in a system that hadn't changed with it. So I looked at it and I was frankly astounded. Are you absolutely convinced that you are making a difference, that this is working? I'm absolutely convinced that, that we are making a difference. Am I absolutely convinced in each and every case? No. Some cases are just too tough? Well, it's not that the case is too tough. It's just that the kid is too far gone, frankly. There are too many obstacles against us. It doesn't mean that you don't try to make a difference, but it's the, there's just too many at-risk factors, and we're not able to overcome those. And juvenile crime has fallen dramatically here, faster and further than almost anywhere else in the United States. And other cities have started to take notice. 60 Minutes' Steve Croft was more than impressed with what he witnessed in Jacksonville. So you would describe Jacksonville's approach to juvenile crime as, as cutting edge, as very progressive? Well, I think that it's, I, I'd say that, uh, that it is the consensus of the people that we talk to a, uh, outside of Jacksonville and putting the story together that this is the most innovative program in the country by far. Um, it's the one that people all over the United States are paying the most attention to. It's the one that uh, a lot of communities are, are looking at the copy all, if not uh, uh, parts of it. We begin our in-depth reporting tonight with some answers. NBC's Fred Francis on the Law and Order B. <laughs> Hard time in Jacksonville, Florida for dangerous felons. But the inmates here are children. This is no picnic, and, and it's not intended to be. It's intended to send a message. Shorstein says for these kids, and for us, it may be the last chance. Fred Francis, NBC News, Jacksonville. The state attorney's program is also grabbing attention around the world, including Japanese and French TV. Les délinquants juvéniles sont jugés comme des adultes. Jacksonville's success with youth crime has caught the attention of lawmakers here. When Harry Shorstein addressed the Ontario Crime Commission, Canadian television took notice 
and traveled to Jacksonville to see the prosecutor's program firsthand. It's not a matter of getting tough. It's a matter of getting smart. Canadian TV showed examples of the mentors that work with young inmates while they're behind bars. They also pointed to a Florida State University study of this entire juvenile justice approach showing a cost savings to the community as high as $31 million. Over a three-year period, he's managed to prevent about 8,000 crimes by young offenders. If you understood how poorly we do on children's issues and how little money we spend on teenage pregnancy prevention, education, uh, low birth weight babies, uh, Florida has always done very, very poorly, which explains to me why we do so poorly 15 years later in juvenile crime. To curb young criminals from committing crime after crime, Shorestein and the school system together opened a real school right in the jail. It is school number 176. No chance to skip class here. The student inmates are using their minds and are also able to leave the jail when their sentence is up with a degree. For young people on the outside who don't attend school, the measures here are drastic, at least for those students' parents. After many warnings, parents who don't force their children to attend class are arrested. Prevention is crucial, and kids who are considered at risk are pinpointed at an early age before they start committing crimes. Arthur is 17 years old. He also was sentenced to one year in county jail. Arthur, could you stand up and introduce yourself, please? 897-04204-5. These children are able to see the justice system firsthand while they still have their freedom. On the outside, I get, you know, basically I have, I have my freedom. I get to do what I choose. But in jail, I, I can't do that. This is a cold, hard look at the reality of life in the lockup. I get out of my jail. The goal? For these kids never to see the inside of a jail again. The entire program is part of a cooperative effort between <clears throat> community leaders. There's one thing that's really unique about what we have going in Jacksonville. It, it is that the, the three entities, from the prosecutor's office to the sheriff's office to uh, all of the types of things that the city does, are working with the same mission in mind. And, uh, you know, absent that, you couldn't have the kind of dramatic downturn in juvenile crime that we've seen here. When you can look at the statistics and you can see the difference, that's one thing. But when you talk to people in the community and they feel the difference, uh, and the perception is, it's, it's much better. I think that's more significant than the uh, actual, actual statistics. The key to our success, unbelievable support and cooperation from Mayor John Delaney and Sheriff Ned Glover. Working together with the Duval County School Board and a number of other agencies, we've become a prototype for the rest of the country. Uh, we have made tremendous progress, and we're very proud of what we've achieved here in Jacksonville. The citywide effort to stop juvenile offenders in their tracks is working. Just look at the numbers for juvenile arrests since 1993. Murder, down 78%. Rape and sex offenses, down 53%. Robbery, down 32%. Aggravated assault, down 15%. Vehicle theft, down 58%. And weapons charges, down 36% and the numbers continue to drop. There will always be children and teenagers who steal, who are violent, who have no sense of right and wrong. But the city of Jacksonville will not be standing by watching it happen. Community leaders have vowed to take the initiative and fight back. Because of these efforts, the decent citizens of Jacksonville, Florida, are winning the war on crime. Mr. Shorstein, that's uh, very impressive. I'd like to have a copy of that tape so I could uh, show that to some of the mayors in other parts of the country where I travel. So I uh, hope you'll give me a copy of that when we're through. You have it. Uh, Mr. Timoney, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Barton and other members of the committee. My name is John Timoney, and I've been the police commissioner of Philadelphia for the last year. Uh, prior to that experience, I spent 29 years in the New York City Police Department uh, retiring as the first deputy commissioner in 1996, which is the number two person in that organization under Commissioner William Bratton. 
The two intervening years I spent as a consultant advising governments and police departments uh, around the world. However, in 1994, as the Chief of Department under Commissioner Bratton, which was the highest ranking uniform member, I had the good fortune of being a member of a team that changed fundamentally the way in which the New York City Police Department approached its core mission. As part of our new approach, we developed an entirely new and much more effective set of policies and procedures for tackling urban crime and disorder. It is the result of this experience, as well as my experience as a consultant to police departments around the world, that I want to share with you today. As most of you already know, the heart of the new approach to fighting crime introduced by Commissioner Bratton in New York is a process known as CompStat. Many experts have written at length about CompStat, about its origins, its key features, and why it has proved so effective in reducing crime in the country's most densely populated city. It's not my aim today to add to, the to this historical and largely theoretical discussion about CompStat, or even to defend my decision to introduce it in Philadelphia. I prefer to use this opportunity to tell you how the federal government can make the CompStat process an even more powerful tool, tool in fighting crime in, in our cities. In my view, there are three main features of the CompStat process. The first is the decentralization of the decision making to local commanders. It is the local commanders who are the closest in touch with crime and quality of life conditions in his or her neighborhood. He or she is therefore best placed to develop and implement the strategies necessary to tackle these conditions, and it is in his or her responsibility to take the lead in doing so. This is the approach that we have adopted in Philadelphia. The role of top management and headquarters is to support, advise, and supply the local commander and to set the policy framework within which he or she must work. It is also our role to monitor the performance of the local commander and to hold him or her accountable for that performance. To formalize this monitoring and accountability process, we have also introduced the second important feature of CompStat, namely the weekly meetings at which local commanders report their performance to the, department, to the department's top management, including myself and deputy commissioners and the heads of all the special bureaus. At these meetings, local commanders describe the condition in their districts and what they are doing about them. Some of these presentations are success stories. At other times, however, when local commanders find themselves having to explain why the strategies they outlined at an earlier meetings have not been nearly as successful as they had suggested they would be. The third and most important feature of the CompStat process is the, the use of computerized maps of crime information. Rather than talking about what these maps show and why they are so valuable, I have brought with me today Mr. Robert Cheatham, who is a senior uh, policy analyst with the Philadelphia Police Department's Crime Mapping Unit who will give you a brief demonstration on this exciting and powerful new technology. Robert? Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Commissioner Tumini has asked me to show you a few examples of what we do in Philadelphia in terms of crime mapping. He has just told you a little bit about a process known as CompStat. There are several uh, facets to this, as he's explained, but um, one of the most important is timely and accurate uh, data, as well as the maps used to visualize that data. The information technology uh, that has brought crime analysis and mapping to the mainstream is, is known as geographic information systems. As with all things in information technology, this is an acronym. Uh, it's also known as GIS. After CompStat, that's the second acronym for the afternoon. I promise I won't give you any more. Uh, in fact, I'm not here to tell you about GIS technology. Rather, I would like to more concretely show you how it can be and is being used in terms of law enforcement efforts. Now, unfortunately, I, I can't show you the live maps we use in the weekly CompStat meetings. However, I prefer, prepared a few static examples to illustrate some of the concepts Commissioner Timoney has just discussed. Slide, please. Brief introduction. The city of Philadelphia covers about 144 square miles. The police department breaks the city up into a couple dozen districts ranging from about one square mile to as much as 16 square miles. The weekly CompStat meetings are on a four-week rotation so that over the course of a month, each of these districts is examined in detail. Tomorrow, for example, the northwest and northeast districts, uh, northeast police divisions will be up. Mapping and GIS are using law enforcement in a variety of ways, and I'll, I'll just briefly go through a few of them. Um, visualization is one, accountability, 
and for planning purposes. Slide, please. Okay. At their most fundamental level, uh, the maps and charts that are used for this are, are very much visualization tools. This is not necessarily new. Law enforcement officials have been making and using pin maps for over 100 years, uh, long before we had computers to assist us. But information technology offers us some significant advantages in terms of mapping and analysis of crime. We can construct maps more rapidly. We can assign symbols in, a, in several different ways. We can deal with enormous data sets. And we can mix data from a variety of different sources. The map you see in front of you uh, is very typical of what officers and command staff will see at tomorrow's CompStat meeting. It is symbolized in this case according to eight-hour shifts that police officers work uh, and the incident sets are, are drawn from databases that literally include millions of unique events that occur in a given year. Next slide, please. Several days prior to each weekly CompStat meeting, copies of maps and charts, such as the ones you are now viewing, are sent out to each of the district commanders, and then later, at the actual meeting, these are projected live on the wall, much as we're doing now, except the maps can be manipulated to follow the conversation. Next, please. As the dialogue between the command staff and district officers progresses, the maps are used as a, as a support tool to visualize both the geography of the area being covered and the most recent events occurring in that area. Next, please. For example, if the conversation turns to a few blocks in a particular neighborhood, we can zoom into that area, dynamically add or subtract thematic layers of information. Comparisons can be visually drawn between events in the current four-week cycle and the previous four-week cycle. If we have data uh, uh, that we can use, we can actually overlay other kinds of information, such as the locations of schools, ATM machines, or vacant lots in juxtaposition to where a particular class or, uh, 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 of events is occurring. In this way, uh, next slide please, we can attempt to ferret out patterns, clusters, and relationships between events. Now, it is important to understand that the computers don't do the work for us. Computers are notoriously poor at any kind of pattern recognition. But we as human beings are very good at this. The computers allow us to rapidly manipulate and visualize complex information so that we can take advantage of the human being's unique genius for pattern recognition. Next slide, please. The example you see before you is one in which we've drawn a, a simple circle around uh, at about a thousand foot radius around uh, public schools. Next slide, please. Uh, the slides that's in, fr in front of you now and the next couple that I'll show are actual examples of what will be seen in uh, tomorrow's ComStat meeting. The first one shows some burglaries in the northwest section of the city, District 35. Uh, the burglary patterns are often different for commercial burglaries as opposed to residential burglaries. Similarly, daytime burglary patterns are different from nighttime patterns. So we adjust our symbology accordingly. In this particular example, the, the red homes on the map uh, represent residential burglaries and the black buildings commercial. Next one, please. The one we're now looking at uh, shows stolen vehicles and recovered vehicles. The stolen vehicles are in red and the recovered in blue. Uh, there are also thefts from vehicles overlaid on top of that, and those are the light blue dots. The other colored regions uh, indicate the location of where school grounds are, the, the yellow areas, and uh, parks. Uh, we can also think, show things like shopping malls and so on. Next, please. We can also indicate where multiple events occur at the same location and where arrests have brought in a suspected perpetrator. It's somewhat difficult to see on these particular maps, but uh, there are white stars on top of the areas in which we have multiple uh, events. Next slide, please. At a more sophisticated level, we can also use this technology more, for more planning-oriented and tactical purposes. Here you can see how concentrations of events uh, change in time. The large orange blobs uh, may look like I spilled my lunch on the map, but in fact, they're, they're, they're quite revealing. Uh, what you see here are actually concentrations of crimes involving firearms in some very troubled neighborhoods in North Philadelphia. Over the past six months, uh, we've been engaged in a large cross-agency, cross-jurisdictional anti-narcotics operation called Nar Operation Sunrise. On uh, the right-hand side of each of these maps, uh, there is a phase one and phase two in Roman numerals. These are the areas that Operation Sunrise has already had some impact in the first six months. The top map, you can see July to December 1997, uh, gun crimes in that area, and in the bottom map, July to December 98, 
The darkest orange areas show where the concentrations of violent, uh, violent gun-related crimes are occurring. From this display, we can see uh, uh, upon examination that, we can, that Operation Sunrise is clearly having an impact. The darker orange areas are decreasing in size and intensity. This is important for the people involved in Operation Sunrise to see. One of the rules in this operation is that we don't move to the next phase uh, until we, clearly, until we can clearly show that the current area uh, has been stabilized. Based in part on these maps, Operation Sunrise will begin phase three this week. Next slide, please. Taking these uh, maps of change to the next level, you could click on that map, please. Uh, taking these slides of uh, change to the next level, we can actually take uh, the same sorts of information over, let's say, a six-month period and slice that up into much smaller periods. Uh, if you could press play, please. And uh, string these along into a sort of film strip in which we can show how the concentrations move across the urban fabric through the course of time. Thank you. Next slide, please. In addition to these displays of change over time, we can look at real estate information, aerial photography, socioeconomic data, public health information, uh, several kinds. All of these information sources help us to plan these operations to be more effective use of public funds and to minimize the risk to police officers and other public officials involved. Uh, now, before handing this back to Commissioner Timoney, I'd like to return to a couple of the maps I showed you before. This is an earlier one in which there are concentrations of thefts from vehicle. Uh, and then there are, uh, previous slide, please concentration of thefts from vehicle with the outlines of the police districts drawn on top of it. Those are the, the black lines on the map. I'd like to point out something very important here that is even at stasis, and crime patterns are rarely in a state of stasis, these concentrations span boundaries. In other words, the criminals have no respect whatsoever for the political boundaries drawn by governments. Uh, next slide, please. Returning to the maps that we'll use in Comstat tomorrow, we can see something else. I'd like to draw your attention to this upper northeast corner of Philadelphia, the 7th and 8th districts. You'll notice uh, several clusters of automobile-related crimes along the edges. Uh, one of these is a mall. Uh, the other is a housing development and transportation artery uh, through the region. What you'll also notice is that the dots representing uh, incidents of crime stop at the edge of the city. The same is true on the next slide, please. But in fact, uh, we all know that those dots don't stop. The crimes are occurring just across the boundary. We just can't see them. Next slide, please. In this final slide, we're looking at stolen vehicles again. Uh, this time, the stolen vehicles are in the city, and they're, they're represented by the red stars, and the vehicles outside the city are the blue, are the, are the blue cars. In addition, we've drawn a red line between the two events. Uh, in other words, when we can link where a car was stolen and the place uh, from which it was recovered, We've made that link explicit. We often use such uh, maps such as this to locate so-called chop shops, where stolen vehicles are uh, chopped up into parts for resale. In this particular case, these vehicles are recovered outside the city, or in many cases, such as Camden, uh, the city of Camden in the lower right, outside the state. But what you see is only half the story. We cannot see where the cars uh, are either stolen outside the, recover uh, outside the city or recovered inside. We lack the data. And more importantly, we lack standards to exchange information with other law enforcement agencies that surround the city. That ends my presentation. I'll turn things back to Commissioner Timoney, and he'll discuss some of the ways in which this might be addressed. Sorry. Thank you, Robert. Uh, as we said prior, we, we use the, the CompStat process to, to set uh, strategic and target goals. The probably the most fundamental uh, important step is timely and accurate information. To guarantee that we have timely and accurate information, I have uh, established a quality assurance bureau, uh, re which reports directly to me, which makes sure that our information is both timely and accurate. Additionally, I have appointed an independent expert, Professor Larry Sherman of the University of Maryland, to advise me on the matters of, of crime reporting and uh, the correlation of, of crime. But accuracy and timeliness, although necessary, uh, on a necessary basis on which to plan a crime-fighting strategy, is not sufficient alone. In order to fight crime effectively, police commanders have to identify crime patterns that Robert mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, as you saw from the maps, these patterns often cross uh, boundaries because criminals uh, recognize no artificial uh, political boundaries. As a result of our meetings in Comstat, uh, I, 
I decided, along with the uh, concurrence of, of Mayor Andel, to host a meeting of the four major counties surrounding Philadelphia, along with about uh, 100 different uh, police jurisdictions, to share the information uh, and give them a demonstration on the mapping capabilities of Philadelphia, and also to promise them we would assist them in setting up, uh, if, if they so desired, uh, mapping for their individual areas. And the response on the part of the chiefs in the surrounding areas was nothing, uh, was nothing short of spectacular. I'm delighted to report that they welcomed these suggestions enthusiastically, and we've begun working out a formula to make sure uh, that this happens uh, over the near future. But my suggestion might have uh, not been so enthusiastically endorsed. Uh, the colleagues, my colleagues, may have preferred to continue, continue doing things uh, on their own. All of us would have suffered, and none of us would have been able to tackle the problems of our own. That is why I believe the federal government has an important role to play here, enabling police departments across the country to exchange crime information electronically is too important a goal to be left uh, to the voluntary uh, actions at the local level. I know that the Department of Justice is now thinking about how best to approach this subject, but I believe that the time for thinking has passed. It is now time for action. If the federal government is serious about helping local communities to fight crime more effectively, it is this area in which it can and, and should take a strong lead. Uh, it should uh, set up a commission to develop common uh, data and technical standards for the criminal justice system and to take positive steps to encourage local agencies to endorse and adopt them. Computer mapping of the kind you've just seen is only one example of how science and technology can significantly strengthen the crime-fighting capabilities of local police departments. DNA, automatic fingerprint identification systems, ballistic identification systems are other areas in which members of the committee may be familiar. The point I want to make is that we, as we approach the new millennium, effective policing requires more than uniformed police officers on the street. Police departments also need sophisticated scientific and technological support. This means specialist equipment, systems, and professionals to operate them. For example, forensic scientists, information technologists, and communications engineers. Here again, I believe the federal government can play a vital role. For too long, law enforcement community in this country has relied on others, mainly in the defense industry, to develop the science and technology that it needs to do its job. But policing local communities is very different from fighting foreign enemies. The police have special needs that are unlikely to be understood or met by military suppliers. I therefore believe that the time has come to establish a national laboratory of criminal justice uh, and law enforcement, science and technology, similar but independent of the well-known laboratories that support the Department of Defense. It should be staffed by the finest professional scientists and technologists working alongside the best criminal justice professionals. Its mission should be to become the center of excellence in the application of science and technology to the problems of the criminal justice system. As well as carrying out a program of applied research and development, it should be available to assist individual departments with difficult operating requirements, uh, expensive specialist equipment, or other expertise. A model for such laboratory already exists in the United Kingdom. It is funded and managed by the national government and is an important part of the UK policing scheme both because of its research findings and its technical support activities. It was that laboratory which was responsible for first applying DNA technology to the world of criminal justice. The establishment and maintenance of such a facility is not the project which, can, which one can expect an individual community to take on, no matter how large or how rich this community is. Some might argue, however, that this is something which the FBI or some other federal law enforcement agency should take the lead, but this would give the institution a much narrower focus than I believe it should have. I would like to see it serve the whole criminal justice community, not just the law enforcement sector. And its principal focus should be on local concerns rather than national ones. Crime is primarily a responsibility of local communities. And the experience in New York and elsewhere has proven that it is most effectively tackled at the local level. But I believe that the federal government can play an important role in helping local communities carry out their responsibilities even more effectively. It can do this by providing those things like the development of national standards and the support of major research and development programs that can only be delivered nationally. In this way, the federal government can legitimately help local communities to help themselves. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Timoney. <clears throat> Has anybody ever told you you resemble Richard Harris, the movie star? Only about a million and a half times. 
Well, from I the just, same country. I, Maybe that's what it is. I just was waiting for you to start singing MacArthur Park. <laughs> I just, well, first of all, uh, I want to thank you both very, very much for, for being here. Uh, you know, uh, in the press, I think you've been described as a cop's cop. And uh, toward that end, what makes you a cop's cop more uh, capable of making decisions than somebody who's just graduated from some crime school? Oh, I, I think, uh, while I'm all for education, I have a lot of education. Uh, there is nothing to be experienced uh, on the street dealing with, especially in large urban areas, dealing with diverse communities. And, uh, you know, I have worked in, in some of the tougher parts of New York in a variety of assignments from patrol to plain clothes to narcotics. I th combined with a formal education, I think I bring a unique uh, experience and, and, and resume, if you will, in, in, into fighting crime. And I think with good leadership, good systems, uh, no police departments can be much more effective uh, at the local level in, in fighting crime, uh, I think, than they ever had uh, in, in the past. You're adopting, I, I, I presume, a great many of the of uh, the programs and systems that uh, Mayor Giuliani talked mm -hmm. about earlier today. And right. If you, you were the chief deputy commissioner in New York. That's correct. And so I, I presume that what you're doing is taking a lot of those same ideas, with all uh, augmented by new ideas you're coming up with, to Philadelphia. Correct. And, and the, the one addition, I mean, there are, there are a lot of additions, but the one, this young man sitting next to me, he and two of his colleagues are graduates of the University of Pennsylvania that have uh, degrees, sophisticated degrees in computer science. And that's uh, a new appreciation that I have for the civilian end of the, of the policing world, that even us tough, hardened veterans can learn from young civilians that are specifically trained in this high-tech area. Very good. Uh, this ComStat program you're talking about, do you know how many American cities are adopting that besides Philadelphia and New York? Uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, uh, I, th I think most of them have taken on some form uh, of the CompStat process. Or they, I think a lot of them uh, don't do it uh, quite correctly. The, the one thing that's misunderstood, I think, about, uh, about CompStat, the one uh, important feature for me is the, the CompStat process, those weekly meetings that are chaired by myself and the executive staff, for the first time ever in American policing, it has got top management involved in day-to-day -day crime fighting. Before. Trust me, uh, growing up the organization, the big chiefs never got involved in fighting crime on a day-to-day -day basis. The CompStat process, the crime is laid out on maps. It forces you to deal with it. It forces you to get actively involved. It forces you to help the local commanders come up with decisions regarding strategies uh, and how to deal with this stuff effectively. That's, that, I think, is the, the unappreciated uh, uh, side benefit of the CompStat process. Do you think uh, a great many more uh policemen being funded at the federal level and sent to the local communities would be helpful? Or do you think the money would be better spent giving it to the city police chiefs in the form of a block grant and let them come up with the innovative ideas on how to stop crime? Which is, I mean, you know, we have a limited number of federal dollars right. that we're going to spend. And of course, the, and I'm not, don't want to get partisan in any way, but yeah. the, the administration has one view and that is to put more policemen on the streets, which, with, with which I have, I share a great deal of uh, yeah. support. Uh, but then there's a, another attitude which has been expressed, I think, by Mayor Giuliani and, and, and I think you guys to a degree, and that is that it would be better to block grant the money back because cities have individual problems and needs and it would be better to let them come up with innovative ways to spend that money. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's always nice, as you, as you said, to have more police officers, but the idea of having a lot more discretion uh, sometimes to choose between a single police officer, for, a, for example, at, at $40,000 per year and a piece of technology that may benefit 100 police officers, uh, leaving it up to the local chief to make that decision, uh, I think is always a wise decision. So you think that would be a, a, a better approach because you can handle, you, you understand the problems better at the local level than the federal level? That's correct. Uh, I, I, yeah, with, without a doubt. I think the more discretion that, that the local commanders are allowed to have regarding uh, uh, Spending money is, is always desirable. You agree with that? Yes, I do. Well, that was a quick answer. No, I, I think there's a lot of analogy uh, that can be drawn between uh, Comstat and our juvenile justice program. And we hate to use the war analogy, but essentially what mapping does is recognizes where the problems are 
and you direct your efforts and your resources or your troops, if you will, to the uh, most important fronts. I think the same analogy can be drawn to uh, focusing on juvenile crime. Uh, historically, the federal and state and local uh, governments have uh, ignored juvenile crime and waited and addressed uh, crime by programs such as Three Strikes and You're Out, which are programs we often support because they, the punishments are warranted. Uh, if the war is raging on the 11 to 18-year-old, and as Mr. Horn pointed out earlier, starting with fighting crime at zero to three, uh, uh, stopping teenage pregnancy, uh, dealing with welfare reform so that uh, you're not making decisions here in Congress that essentially contribute to future criminal problems. So I, I, I do agree, it's, a, it's probably a long answer to your question, mm -hmm. uh, I, that uh, we not only are better able to understand what I refer to as traditional crime, the rape, robbery, and murder type crime, than you are because we deal with it uh, more comprehensively. Uh, but when we develop programs, hopefully with your support, if they're effective, then we're better able, even politically, to enhance our own efforts. As you've seen, I think, in our video, uh, the support is very, very broad within my jurisdiction. I have some more questions, but I'll now yield to Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate the testimony that you gentlemen have provided. It's really excellent what you're doing, and uh, it deserves to be a national model, and I guess you probably have a lot of inquiries, both of you, every day. And uh, Mr. Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani, this morning uh, certainly uh, had a turnaround, and I know it can be done. I uh, was in Philadelphia when I was Vice Chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and we examined the police department. I'm delighted to see you, Commissioner, because it was absolute chaos in that department 20 years ago where they had no deadly force policy, for example. You just shot at somebody. There was no policy. And we had the good uh, mayor at that time, ex-police commissioner, who left a lot of problems there. And uh, I tried out a deadly force situation on him, and I said, you got 10 seconds to make up your mind, not just three. And where's the policy? And we found two young children had been killed by the police, both 16, one white, one black, and it was just a mess. So I'm, I'm sure you're straightening that one out. But what interests me here is what you're doing is right at the core of it, and that's to get them early out of the cycle, and you're right about the truancy, and uh, you're right about keeping them busy and all the rest. And I guess I'd like to know, under either the laws you have to operate or the grants you have to operate, I hear you want them discretionary, and I certainly agree with that, but how much flexibility do you have in both cities to do what you think needs to be done based on your practical experience? Uh, are the laws and ordinances and grants, federal, state, uh, do they limit you in some ways that you would like not to be limited if you're going to be even more successful? Uh, more, to answer, <laughs> would, we, would we like more flexibility? Yes, I, I can give you uh, some examples. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, another uh, area where the federal government has been helpful to us uh, has been in uh, establishing a drug court uh, program office where, where we have received federal funding for drug courts, which, which I believe are very effective. I have an adult and a juvenile uh, drug court in Jacksonville. Uh, but again, there are some very, very strict uh, limitations that are not always practical. It seems as if well-intentioned grant policies get bogged down, understandably in some cases, with restrictions that are not practical. Now, conversely, or as lawyers always say on the other hand, uh, I respect your very, very difficult decision in trying to understand where the money should go. Uh, I jokingly I addressed the, the other body last year and uh, I told the senator, we don't want your advice, we just want your money, uh, which is sort of truthful, but, uh, but, but it, it was a joke. Uh, I'm always asked, how do we tell Congress to draw the legislation so as to see that the money gets to the place it's intended? 
it's a very, very difficult problem, Congressman. And um, uh, again, sarcastically, I could say I'm just a prosecutor. That's really your problem. What we're doing to education in this Congress is to make sure that 95 percent of every grant in education gets into the classroom, not skimmed off by the Federal Department of Education, not skimmed off by the State Department of Education, not skimmed off by the County Department of Education or the local unified school district. And I think that will help get the money where the people that are on the firing line do the good things and make the difference. And that's exactly what you're asking for, and we ought to do it. I think the best thing Congress ever did in this area was the Revenue Sharing Act that lasted from Nixon to Reagan. Unfortunately, Reagan gave in to the lobbying forces here and the Democrats, and uh, they destroyed the program. And yet it gave local council members who know their city a lot better than any of us do sitting here and uh, gave them the authority to get the job done, be it parks or police or whatever was the need of that city. I hope one of these days when we retire the national debt a few trillion dollars that we can get back to that. But let me ask you in a couple of other areas. You mentioned DNA, and uh, I'm curious, uh, Commissioner, what is your thinking along that line? Is, is that uh, that uh, we keep uh, juvenile files on DNA in case crimes develop and uh, you can check the DNA against the file? Or what's your thinking on that? It's a great. Yeah, but I, I, I am really, uh, I, I am hesitant uh, against central data banks uh, unless somebody has been uh, arrested and, and, and convicted of a crime. Uh, I think you have to be real, real careful. Uh, Anytime you have any kind of central files, whether uh, I mean, you just have to have to extremely, extremely uh, careful. The, 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 the thing I'm arguing for, as far as DNA, though, is that the where the federal government has a has a role, whether it's in DNA or or other technology, technologies or standards, is is coming coming up with clear uh, federal standards and guidelines. Uh, even DNA is not compatible, for example, between Philadelphia. And the, and the Pennsylvania State Police, and then Philadelphia, and, and the FBI, they need uh, certain standards that, that go across the country. Uh, the same thing for, for crime reporting. What we're trying to do in Philadelphia is recognize the artificial political boundaries that surround Philadelphia and encourage our, uh, our chiefs of police in the surrounding areas uh, to come and partner with us using this mapping. And we're developing, we're taking now CompStat to the next level a regional type comp stat that where we do not recognize uh, for planning purposes, strategic planning purposes, artificial uh, boundaries. That, that's what we're all about. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we're receiving great enthusiastic response from the local communities surrounding Philadelphia. But the, the, the importance of DNA or, or anything else is setting up uh, standards, national standards that all police departments uh, can abide by. Now, to what degree do we have any sort of a national standard now? Has the FBI ever generated some thinking in this area, or what's happening? Well, do you want to answer? Uh, three though. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to answer? No, you go. Oh. This one. Gordon Wasserman, who's my chief of staff and, and advisor also in technology, sits on some of these committees. No, this is a very technical area uh, and the answers are, are not straight there are at the moment uh, several ways of taking D doing dna profiles and that's why the commissioner was right saying some profiles don't compare with others the the, the federal government is working on standardizing the simplifying the way dna is taking and, and, and standardizing on a particular method for yeah. taking a dna profile it's, a, it's the, after all dna developed from medical technology and it's now being applied uh, to the criminal justice system, but it's very much okay. something which has come from a, another sector, and there is no uh, yet agreed, uh, that is nationally agreed way of taking a profile. But it's the standards the Commissioner has been talking about, not only in DNA, but even fingerprint systems, as you probably know, don't talk to each other. They're proprietary standards of fingerprint systems or ballistic identification systems, so that we in Philadelphia have one method of identifying ballistics uh, shell casings, but we can't compare ours electronically with those shell casings uh, analyzed across the river in Camden, New Jersey. So uh, there are many examples of how 
proprietary standards which in suppliers develop in order to sell their products, whether it be a ballistic uh, identification system or an automatic fingerprint system or some other systems, uh, uh, develop their own proprietary systems which prevent local agencies from exchanging this information electronically. Uh, and we all know this from our own computer systems, that computer systems can't be linked together unless uh, common standards have been developed. So with this very specialized technology used for criminal justice, we need to agree standards. I mean, we couldn't have telephone systems which spoke to each other. I mean, we couldn't speak to someone living in, in China unless the Chinese telephone authorities and the American telephone authorities had agreed a common standard. And so that's the problem we have of comparing uh, fingerprints or ballistics or, or anything else. And that's why we want to well, I'm glad I asked that question because you've educated me on this and uh, Mr. Chairman, either at the full committee level or at my subcommittee on government management level where we have jurisdiction over the information laws of the federal government and electronic uh, transmittal of uh, data over that, you raise a very interesting question. It isn't that something's wrong with the DNA test and its value if you can analyze it correctly but what is not agreed upon is right now, will any of these different samplings around the country uh, fit in where you can have reliance on what that data is, uh, what the data are telling you? So we'll, we'll take a look at it, and you two look like good witnesses in this area <laughs> down the line. Let me ask about arms. Would you yield on that yeah. real quick? Uh, I want to make sure I understand what you just said. Uh, there's an inconsistency in the different in the systems that are used by different locales in, in, in keeping these records. And therefore it makes it difficult to compare them across state or or county lines for that matter. Uh, are you advocating that uh, or would you advocate that uh, there be some kind of a national norm set up maybe by Congress not to interfere with the collection of this data? but to make sure there's consistency in the way they keep these records so that they could be com uh, compared. For instance, <coughs> fingerprints from L.A. to New York, uh, DNA samples from L.A. to New York, so that in a moment's notice they could be compared for law enforcement purposes and you wouldn't run into this problem with different systems. I mean, that's, that's clearly it. But, but even, even now, for example, in, in the ballistics area, uh, with the FBI and ATF have two separate systems. One has drug fire, the other has brass catcher. They're, they're two completely different systems. Well, for, what I'm saying is should, uh, we, should we move toward uniformity? Oh, I, oh, absolutely, clearly, well, that, yeah. That is something that we probably ought to look at. That might be much more cost effective in the long run if we had that kind of uniform requirement. Right. Chairman, can I just say, I mean, what makes the Internet work so well is there are standards that have been developed. So we can now uh, look up uh, at a press of a button. We can read the newspaper from Paris and London, and that's because certain standards have been agreed. What we'd like to see in the criminal justice field, and not, and not so much in the DNA, that's a very specialist field, and there's people are working towards a common way of analyzing it. But in information, which is so much more important, in the preparation of the criminal information and the collection of the information, this information, every single police department collects the same information. It's there in their computer systems. But it's, but it's there in a different way. And there are two ways. The data is different. They collect it in a slightly different way. And the computer system is different. If we could agree on that, then we could produce these same maps for the whole of the Philadelphia region uh, through electronic interchange. And the Department of Justice is thinking about Which this. Which would help the whole justice system. Absolutely. Go ahead, Mr. Warren. I'll indulge, if you'll indulge me on two more well, questions. Well, I'll be glad to indulge Chairman. you. I realize there's a real backup here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the arms in an urban area, what is your policy and feelings that ought to be done in that area, the degree to which uh, arms, be they uh, Saturday night specials, be they handguns of one sort or the other. What would you as, com uh, as Commissioner of Police in Philadelphia recommend in that area and what would you as State Attorney in Jacksonville recommend? I'm interested in your views on that. Well, th there is a particular problem uh, with Pennsylvania now. As a result of, of, of certain states, uh, notably Maryland and Virginia passing one gun a month uh, legislation, Philadelphia now, all of a sudden, uh, when you're looking at uh, illegal guns that are confiscated in New York, Philadelphia all of a sudden in the last two or three years has become a source state 
largely as a result of the ability to, for straw man purchases where a legitimate citizen can go in and purchase uh, 30, 90, uh, 100 weapons uh, and then go file down the numbers and go sell these uh, guns out in the street in West Philly or, or up in New York City. I testified in Harrisburg on Monday uh, to try and get a, a reasonable piece of legislation that doesn't infringe upon the rights to bear arms. There's nobody, there's nobody ta attacking the Constitution that way. But to try and to remove the profit uh, from illegal sales of handguns through straw man purchases. And, and that's what we're looking right now. That, that's a front burner issue for myself and Mayor Rendell in, in Philadelphia. Uh, other uh, states have, have gone that way, uh, but Phil uh, Pennsylvania has not. You're addressing a, a, an unbelievably difficult problem. Uh, I firmly believe that there are too many guns out there, and, and I believe that there is no justification for not doing everything in the world to separate juveniles from firearms. The types of crimes we see today are so different than the crimes I prosecuted in the 60s and 70s. They mirror the uh, sensationalism of uh, of the uh, violent television shows. You, you seldom ever find a, a revolver used in a, in a, in a, of course, that's an exaggeration, but everything now is a semi-automatic weapon or, or a firearm. But politically, it, it seems as if Washington and I know my state bogs down on the issue of firearms. So I guess we can't let it destroy good legislation, and I'm afraid it may have last year with the federal legislation on juvenile crime, both in the House and in the Senate. The, the, the word we got, those of us who were fighting for the uh, federal legislation, is it's going to die on the issue of firearms and gun locks because the NRA cannot live with gun locks. My response to you would Which be, is outrageous. let's address it some other day and get on with the, uh, and let me give you one last example that I'm very proud of because I do believe there are too many guns. In my jurisdiction, I got with Marion Hammer, who at the time was the Florida director of the NRA and I think ultimately the national president, and I said, we disagree somewhat on gun control. But let's get together and implement the Eddie Eagle Gun Safety Law, which is an N or program, which is an NRA program that teaches children to get away from firearms. And it was a great joining of hands of between two people who had different views on firearms generally, but who agreed on the issue of juvenile crime and violent juvenile crime. So all I can tell you is that firearms in the inner city are, are to my knowledge, an unbelievable on, problem On everywhere. the inner city and the gangs in the inner city, some cities have tried to bring a class action against the gang as a whole to accept responsibility when one of those gang members is killing some poor four-year-old who just accidentally happened to be out at 8 p.m. in the evening and they f are going to fire bullets into the house because that's where another gang member or brother, perhaps, uh, lives. Uh, have you thought of or pursued that uh, line in any way, either in Philadelphia or Jacksonville, where you just nail them and they have to start paying the bills for the people there, one of their members is killing? Well, you, you, you address a very interesting point, uh, which I understand was done in, in New York. I, I was on a About national California, panel. California, there was some. And also. in California. It, it was a good, uh, a rare good marriage between local and federal law enforcement because generally uh, I believe you should leave the violent crime war to those of us on the local level. But they did use the federal RICO statutes, I understand, in New York to target gangs and prosecute the gang itself as a racketeer enterprise, uh, leaving the substantive or the individual substantive prosecutions to the uh, state level. Uh, that was one of the rare presentations I've heard where the federal government uh, did help us uh, uh, effectively in addressing uh, violent and serious crime. What else do you think you need to do along the line that you're already doing it and haven't done for one reason or the other? Is there another stage here that both of you feel we ought to be doing nationwide? Well, I agree with what the commissioner said uh, as far as standardization, uh, not just in the area of DNA, because that addresses a lot of uh, legal problems. Various states have different uh, legal bases for the admission of DNA or for any scientific evidence uh, throughout the United States. Uh, I guess you can tell by my original presentation, I, I am just fanatically uh, sure that cr addressing crime at zero to 18 is the answer to overall crime reduction. And I can tell you, Congressman, 
when I started this in 1990, listen to us, but now you are, and I think we're about to turn the, the uh, corner on, on what I think is, is the most overlooked uh, uh, addressing of uh, critical crime prevention in the United States. Uh, if you just picture a, a, a chart that I use that shows crimes committed by all criminals age zero to death, it's really 11 through 40, from 11 to 18, the line goes straight up in the degree of violence and the uh, degree of activity of a criminal. From 18 to death, it goes straight down and goes down drastically to age 25, essentially separating the juvenile from the adult criminal justice system. And regardless of everyone's understanding and acknowledgement of that, you and we continue to devote all of our resources, almost all of our resources, to the adult system, ignoring the juvenile system. And I, I think that's unforgivable. Thank you very much. It's impressive what both of you have done. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Let me uh, let me ask a couple. During your your, your conversations, uh, you in particular talking about the young people, you kept talking about how violent it is between, as far as crime is concerned, with children under 18. And uh, do you have any statistical data, or do you have any feelings about how television relates to that, and movies relate to the explosion of violence among young people? No, Mr. Chairman, I don't have statistical data, and I hate to use anecdotal examples, but I have never heard an intelligent presentation that didn't acknowledge the correlation between the violence uh, on television, in the movies, in the music, in crime. I just can't envision someone saying that that is not impacting particularly on well, violent I just juvenile wish, crime. I just wish somebody would think up a way that would not violate the First Amendment so that we could encourage, cajole, browbeat, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the entertainment industry into being a little bit more responsible. Uh, you know, I'm not for censorship, but it just seems like to me there's got to be some way. I remember in New York City, they had... Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, movie about a, uh, a boy that uh, came in and spread uh, wanted the money from a, a teller at a, at a toll gate at uh, a subway, and they sprayed flammable liquid yes. in and set him on fire. And I think within a week they they actually did that. Yeah. And so th th there are examples of where they really do emulate the violence they see on TV. So if you, as law enforcement experts, come up with any ideas that you think might stimulate the entertainment industry to head in a little different direction, please let me know because I'd like to work with you on that. Uh, you indicated, uh, what's wrong? You indicated that uh, you, you compromised with the NRA uh, down in your area on uh, the uh, uh, Eddie uh, Eagle gun safety yes. program. Do you think there are other areas where there could be some uh, some agreement reached between you and the uh, people who believe very strongly in the right to own and bear arms, so that we could protect young people, keep guns as much as possible out of the hands of young people, uh, while at the same time protecting the Second Amendment rights of people? I, I think we're doing it now, uh, uh, Congressman. It, it has to be done because when I sit in my office and hear that the juvenile justice legislation pending before Congress may die on the NRA's opposition, that's, that's just unacceptable. I understand everyone's right to bear arms. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that I agree with the number of arms they're bearing. Uh, I guess if I had my choice, I would tell you only those of us in law enforcement should have guns and none of the rest of you should. But I do understand that constitutionally that's not principled. And I think we have to do what I did. It was, it was somewhat symbolic, but we could get together and agree on legislation and efforts to take guns away from children. And I don't think the NRA well, disagrees with that. I, I, I wish uh, that maybe you and some others like you who are working very hard in the youth area would talk to, I know a lot of the people at the NRA. I'd be very happy to facilitate meetings with you and Wayne LaPierre or Charlton Heston or whoever it might be over there to try to come up with some compromises that would satisfy both or as close to po as, po as possible both so that we could solve some of your problems while at the same time protect those rights. Uh, I want to ask you a couple more questions, uh, Commissioner Timoney. Uh, 
what, what kind of support has the Justice Department given to you and other law enforcement officials like you around the country? Are you getting much support out of the U.S. Justice Department? Or do you kind of just kind of do these things on your own? No, I, that, that wouldn't be fair. I, we, we would like to get some, uh, a lot more support as far as in the area of, of research and development. Most police departments, even a rich police department like the New York City Police Department, does not have the money to engage in any kind of real uh, research and development uh, to, to do pilot programs. And I think that's uh, an appropriate uh, area for the, uh, for the Justice Department uh, to get into. And, and they do, they, they get in a lot more, uh, I would say, in the academic area, but I think that more could be done in, in the area with the practitioners uh, on, 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 the, on the ground. Uh, that, that, that's clearly one area, but uh, no, the, overall, they've, they've been very supportive of us. Uh, Have they helped you at all with the ComStat program? No, no the ComStat program, uh, believe it or not, uh, most people don't know how the ComStat program started. I do, since I was one of the, uh, along with Commissioner Bratton and Jack Maple. The ComStat program started as uh, pin maps, and when we brought in about 50 uh, corporate citizens into police headquarters back in 1994 explained to them what we were trying to do. It was the business community that went out and bought the, actually adopted a district, 76 standalone PCs with printers, with map info for about $8,500, $9,000. It was the business community that actually purchased the original machinery, the individual PCs that started the original uh, CompStop process. And, and do you know how many, how many cities across the country have adopted that? I know, I know hundreds of them have gone to New York and, 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 and have, have seen it, but uh, I don't know how many are practicing. My sense is most of them. I was at the Major City Chiefs Conference in, in, uh, in Los Angeles two weeks ago, and the sense was, at least certainly in, in the 50 uh, major cities, the vast majority of them are, are doing some, some form of ComStat. Well, I think I've exhausted the questions I wanted to ask you. What I would like to end up by saying is if, if you have some data that you could give to me, like the tape that you had, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Shorstein, uh, uh, which we could show to mayors in other cities that may not be conversant with, you know, what's happened in your area. And if you could give us the ComSat program or information on that that we could give to mayors that are not yet using it, maybe we could stimulate some interest that might yeah. help other cities that have high crime problems. I know a lot of them are probably doing this on their own, but I'd like to be able to make copies of your tapes and make copies of your charts and everything in your statistical yep. data and send it out to them so we can maybe stimulate them getting getting started. Let me uh, end up by saying I really, really appreciate your being here. It's been a long day. I know you waited a long time to testify, but uh, you guys have done a great service for your communities and for the country, and I think the information you've given us today is going to help other communities around the country, so you're not only doing a service for yourselves and your communities, but you're going to help other cities as well. So to you and uh, Mayor Giuliani, thank you very much. Nice being with you today. Thank you, Mr. Burton. We stand adjourned. Coming up next, a Senate hearing on the Interior Department's oversight of the Indian Trust Fund, testifying Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt. Later, Thomas Schatz, president of the group Citizens Against Government Waste. Then the first